Okay. So welcome back, everybody. Um, hope you guys ate a big lunch to try to stay awake. Okay, we're going to talk about some more important stuff. So this is kind of a continuation of the talk that we gave earlier with the first responders, okay? Um, and this is, you know, just continuing on the steps of what you're going to do if, if you come to the scene of a, a respiratory arrest patient that, that needs to the proper airway management. Um, so, you know, if those of you that have never intubated a patient or have tried but haven't been successful, this is, this is what you want to see. These are your vocal cords. This is what you should see when you go to intubate a patient. This is vocal cords. This is your trachea. This is your epiglottis up here. Okay. That's what you want to tube. Tube these because as this little saying says, despite amazing advances in science, your patient cannot yet breathe through his stomach. Okay. Um, so why, 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 is this, why am I going on and on emphasizing this so much? Well, because first of all, this is a, a high risk, low frequency procedure, right? How many of y'all have intubated a patient in the last year? <coughs> How many of y'all have done more than two intubations in the last year? Mannequins don't count. <laughs> How many have anybody done more than two in the last year? Oh, well, I'm on the truck. No, real, real life. You're on the truck. You, you know, you, it doesn't. Not there's nobody. Anybody say more than two? That's not a war, a mannequin, or some. You know, you got a lifesaver there to rescue you out of it if it goes bad. Nobody see. So it's not something that that happens very often. And so it's something that we need to address. I mean, you know, we do ACLS, we do PAL, we do ITLS, but what are we doing about this procedure? Not a lot, okay? That's why this is a, there's a big emphasis and there's a big push for me to make sure that this is something that we're going over and something that we're gonna be doing on a very frequent basis because out of everything that we do, <coughs> this is one of the very few things that you'll kill a patient, okay? Some of you may have had the unfortunate situation or circumstance where you've seen this firsthand, okay? Might have even had a lot of you guys in here. Um, and, and that's a big deal, right? I mean, that's not, that's not why we were called on scene. That's not why we're uh, EMS, not to go out there and do something that's gonna kill the patient. Um, our job is to save the patient. So it's, it's a really important thing. It's more than just sticking a tube between the vocal cords, okay? Um, I know we don't do a lot of uniform training on this, but it's something that we're gonna we're gonna emphasize very frequently. Okay, um, you know, there's just some things you shouldn't do. You know, you don't shock a non-shockable rhythm, right? You don't shock sinus tachycardia. You don't give paralytics if someone's complaining that their arm is broken and it's hurting, right? You don't give them paralytics and make them shut up. Hopefully, you don't. Um, just like you should never RSI. This is, this goes back to the lecture that I gave a few months ago. These are the four things that you should never RSI. A patient that's hypoxic, that you can't get their O2 set up. A patient that's hypotensive, okay? Why? Because when you intubate them, their blood pressure is going to drop further and they're potentially going to code on you. A patient that's an acidosis. We've got a lot of diabetics around here, right? Everybody's probably around a DKA call. We have no way of knowing what their pH is, but they're probably acidotic. You want to try avoiding the intubate them because we're probably going to drop their pH further and what happens when you have a low pH code? Um, and then of course, any kind of heart failure and it's always kind of scary because they can always die. <clears throat> so remember that if you haven't watched that video from a few months back where I talk about this in more detail, go back and watch it. Okay. I would encourage you guys to refresh in your, your memories with it periodically from time to time because it's something that you wanna, you wanna keep track of and remember this stuff, okay, very important. Um, so, you know, as you're approaching your patient, you wanna determine what are your challenges, right? There's a lot of physical challenges to intervening <clears throat> a patient. But remember the, the mnemonic LEMON, okay, what does it stand for? Stands for look externally, evaluate the 332 rule of Malin potty score, obstruction, and neck mobility, right? So look externally. Is there anything that you might be able to do that might make it easier? Okay, is, you know, does the patient have a big beard? You get to the scene and your patient is Santa Claus, you know? The beard, it, it, it limits their mobility. These guys that have these big, thick, ZZ top beards. Um, if they got some trimmers or clippers, shave the beard off if you have to, okay? Um, 
if they <coughs> have a bunch of rings around their neck, see if you can get those things off, okay? But if you see anything that's obvious that's going to make this any bit easier, do it, okay, before you get started. Evaluate the 332 rule. Do you guys know what that is? Everybody know what the 332 rule is? It's basically you're checking to see what the dimensions of their, their mouth and their lower jaw are, okay? Because if, if they don't have a chin, this is going to be a difficult intubation, okay? There's not a lot of room there. So the 332 rule is you should be able to take three fingers, open their mouth, and you should be able to open their mouth wide enough to fit three of your fingers. Underneath their chin, you should be able to line up three of your fingers underneath, okay? And then between the, the, the base of their chin and their, their Adam's apple, you should be able to fit two fingers under there, okay? So based on that, I think I'd, I'd probably be intubatable, you know? We're not gonna practice it. <laughs> uh, but, but look at that, okay? Because, okay, if someone doesn't have that, that's something that you need to be prepared for and you need to be wondering, all right, I don't know if I should be getting into this or not, you know? And that's what you need to do. Don't just evaluate it, but use your assessment to help you determine, you know what? I think maybe we ought to just bag or eye gel and go because this is not looking pretty. Um, do your mouth and body score, okay? You don't have to remember these numbers, but just remember what this looks like, okay? This, that's good, that's easy. This, that's bad, that's not gonna be easy, okay? People have different sized tongues and different abilities to open their mouth very wide. If they can open their mouth up very wide, you can see their uvula and you can see, you know, all the way to the earth's end. Okay, that's, that's a good sign. But they open up and all you see is this. All right, you're going to have a problem there, okay? So you better think twice before you, you get yourself into this goat roping. Okay, so remember what this looks like. Obstructions, remove any obstructions. If they got dentures, take them out. If they got food in their mouth, you know, clean it out. If there's vomit, blood, suction, okay? And then neck mobility, position for success. I, uh, we talked a little bit about it on the previous lecture as far as how you want to position them, their head and their neck to make it easier for you. Do it, okay? So keep these things in mind and, and take heed to it. You know, you're, you, you may, you, everybody probably goes through all this, but if you notice, okay, <laughs> this is all not looking the right way, then don't get yourself into that in the first place, okay? Prove you can ventilate the patient before you even make an attempt, all right? You have to be able to ventilate without an ET tube because that's your backup plan, all right? If RSI doesn't work, you better have made sure and proven to yourself that you're able to ventilate that patient like we talked about earlier. Because if you didn't wait, if you didn't take the time to make sure, hey, I'm gonna be able to bag this patient or <clears> I'll be <throat> able to, I can put the eye gel in and I'm able to get the SATs up to 100% and get air into their lungs, what are you gonna do when you get in there and you can't intubate the patient? You're gonna be in trouble, okay? So make sure you've got your basics figured out before you even take this step, all right? Set yourself up for success, get off the floor, all right? Put the patient on your stretcher, raise the stretcher up to whatever height you need it to be to be comfortable and get yourself comfortable, okay? You know, it's just, when you're in an uncomfortable position, whether you're on your knees, you're laying down, you're on this hard, dirty concrete floor or whatever you're on, there's a mouse running over your arm while you're trying to do it. You, you can't tolerate that position for a very long period of time, right? And sometimes this can, this can take a little bit, but if you're uncomfortable, you're straining your back trying to do this, you're gonna become impatient very quickly. You're gonna be like, oh crap, and you're gonna get frustrated and you're not gonna wanna sit there and, and take the time to be successful. So first of all, get the position in the right place that's gonna be comfortable for you and make sure you're not gonna end up hurting yourself and make sure you're comfortable in the position you need to be in to do this. And then make sure you got proper lighting, okay? Turn all the lights on if you're in the house, if you're in the back of the ambulance, make sure all the lights are turned on. I see some of you guys carry flashlights, put the flashlight on. You know, we have these new disposable ring scopes. They have a LED bulb, they're super bright, they're really nice. Um, so make sure you have good lighting and then prepare yourself. Okay. Make sure you have your suction ready to go. Double suction set up is what I would recommend because you don't know what you're going to find when you get in there. Get your rescue devices ready. Get that eye gel ready to go. Okay. Make sure you have your bag. You should already have a bag with a peep valve on it. 
you know, hopefully there's an OPA-NP. If there's not, you get them ready, okay, just in case you don't get the two, and be ready for cardiac arrest, right? Because what we just talked about, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, and if you prepared the patient and prepared yourself to, to not intubate the wrong selection of patients, that shouldn't happen to you, but if it does, put the pads on them just in case, okay? Uh, keep your bougie. How many of you guys have used the bougie to intubate in here? Okay. We're going to talk about the bougie a little bit, okay? Have your bougie on standby, ready to go. And then get the right size of the ring scope. I know, how many of you guys use a Mac and how many use a Miller? How many use a Mac Miller. here? Miller? Okay. So, whatever you use, get the right size, okay? You don't get um, size 4 Mac leg for, you know, a 90 year old lady who's. 65 kilograms, you know, get, get the right size tool that you need. And then don't forget the free bead. High flow nasal cannula at all times, okay? So even when you take the bag off and now you're going to look, that patient's still getting oxygen. Helps keep that sat up, okay? So don't forget that. <clears throat> salad, have you guys ever heard of salad? I'm not talking about the cheap for lunch. Have you heard of the salad technique, anybody here? So it's, it's it's just common sense, but some guy gave it a name and now he gets all the credit for it. But it's basically, it's called suction assisted laryngoscopy airway decontamination. So what you do is you take your suction yonker and you first you clean out the, the back of their mouth and their throat, they got blood, vomit, whatever, as much as you can. And then you stick it down into your esophagus and let it continually suction while you take a look to try to find the cords to intubate the patient, okay? Um, you know, I know our yonker probably wouldn't get any of this stuff, but I don't know any yonker that get this stuff. Okay, sometimes you just got to put your finger and try to scoop it out if you can, or just move it out of the way with the laryngoscope if you can. Okay, but um, that's something that'll help when you got copious emesis or copious blood or anything in the airway that's that's keeping you from seeing anything. Position your patient. Okay, CFE position. All right, that's basically, you crane their neck out a little bit and make sure their ear is in alignment with their sternum. So that's putting that towel roll or bump or whatever under their head and then tilt their head back, okay? You saw earlier, I was showing you guys those, those diagrams that show you how those axes line up a little bit better. If there's no neck complications, you know, it's not a trauma patient or they don't have a broken neck or anything crazy like that. If you don't have anything, something else that works, Slide that patient all the way up, let their head hang off the bed just a little bit, off the head of the bed. And what that does is it hyperextends their neck back, and that mouth is gonna line up with their trachea a little bit better, and it'll make it easier for you to see what you need to see, okay? But make sure you don't have any neck injuries or neck problems before you go doing this, okay? That's, that's one of those things where you do that when, all right, things are bad, we've tried everything, nothing's working, let's see if this helps a little bit. So this is, you know, this is, this is sometimes what makes it difficult. You know, we got a 90 degree turn here. It's almost more than a 90 degree turn. It's like a 90 degree and then it's an up and over turn that we have to make in order to, to be successful at it. So it takes a little bit of maneuvering, okay? Um, this is the diagram from earlier. So you can see our line of sight versus where we need to go. It's almost a 90 degree angle here, right? Look what happens when you put a, a towel roll or whatever under their head and they've got that chin all the way tilted back. Look at how it's lined up now. A little bit closer together, so you're gonna be able to see stuff a whole lot better. And that's what happens basically, even when you hang their head off the edge of the bed, what happens? Their head goes back, their mouth comes back and it lines up a little bit better with that, with that tracheal view, okay? Here's another picture of it and you can see what you're, what you're looking at. This is just a towel roll. This is a towel roll with their head tilted back, and this is without a towel roll with their head tilted back. You see, this one gives you the best look at it. So you, you kind of need both of those to, to have the best view you can get. Another thing you can do, so you got them all the way back, you got them tilted. The other thing you can do is push down on the Adam's apple. What's going to happen when you push on the Adam's apple? You got the, the trachea is way up front. You push down on it, it's going to push it back, and now it's going to bring it into the line of sight, right? How many of you guys do that? I have. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's that's something else that you can do to, to see what you need to see. So when you go in with the, the laryngoscope, you're basically, your goal is to push this entire lower jaw out of the way to see what you need to see, which is right here, okay? So those of you that say you use a Miller blade, you're gonna put the blade behind the epiglottis and you lift this entire lower jaw and tongue and everything out of the way to look at the vocal cords. If you use a Mac blade, the tip of the blade goes in this follicular. Okay, you follow the tongue right into that gap right there. And when you lift up, it basically lifts this flap up and moves it out of the way. But you see how if, you know, when you crank your wrist back, you're not doing anything because it doesn't move anything. All you're doing is indenting in into the base of the tongue, but you're not moving anything out of the way. That's why cranking the, the blade back doesn't do anything for you. You have to lift their entire lower jaw out of the way. Okay, so this is just a diagram. This is a Miller blade. It goes behind, sorry, this is a, a Mac blade. This is kind of blurry, but it goes in that molecular, the Miller, it lifts up the entire epiglottis there. Again, this is, this is the, the view that you want to see, okay? You got your epiglottis, your vocal cords, and then these are called your arytenoid cartilage, okay? And that's something that's important, okay? So you get this view, when you go in to take a look with your laryngoscope, your eye should not leave that person's mouth, okay? So it, you should get into the habit of doing this, not only for this, but for any of your procedures. Set yourself up before you start, all right? So you know you're gonna need your laryngoscope, that's gonna be in your hand. You're probably gonna need a suction, and you're gonna need an endotracheal tube, right? if everything goes well. But if it doesn't, you might need a bougie, right? You might need just to put the eye gel in. So have all this stuff set up and set it up the exact same way anytime you get ready to do this procedure. You should be able to, I should be able to put a blindfold on you and you'll know, obviously the ring skips the hand, but you should know, okay, right next to the head, that's my suction. Right next to that, that's my endotracheal tube. Right next to that, I got my bougie. On the other side, if all that fails, I got my eye gel. And you should have the exact same setup. So you go in with that laryngoscope blade. All right, I got my cords. I need to suction out a little blood. You're not even taking your eyes off the cords. You got your tube and you're putting it right in. You never lose sight of what your, your target is, right? So, so keep that in mind. Get your stuff set up and set it up the right way every single time. You won't, you won't mess up. <clears throat> the other thing is, have your partner, EMT, firefighter, whoever, have them call out the O2 sat on you and have them eagle that, uh, watch that watch that monitor for any issue. Hey, patient's going to be TAC. All right, you need to abort and get the heck out of there. Hey, O2 sats are 94%. We need to stop it. We need a bag. So just have them calling out what the O2 sat's doing. That way you can stay focused on trying to find the cords and not be worried, oh crap, what's his O2 set? Oh crap, what's his heart rate, you know? Just have them say, hey, you're 99, you're good. You're 99, you're good. You're 99, you're good. All right, you're 98, you're still good. Keep going, you know, and, and do what you need to do. Uh, so this is this is a, the view of your, your cords. Again, you don't have to remember this classification, but this helps you kind of know what you need to be doing. You get this view right here, tube it, okay? That's, that's the best view you can get right there. You, you got the cords, you know exactly what you're looking at, and that's a very easy intubation, 100% success rate, all right? And sometimes you get a little bit hard. You got your epiglottis, you see your arytenoid cartilages, but you don't see the cords very well. You still see the opening. That's still something you should be able to intubate that. If you're like, man, I don't know, every time I try to put the tube in, it kind of blocks my view, grab your bougie and put that in. Your bougie is very thin, right? It's not gonna take up as much room in the mouth and in the throat you can easily guide that bougie right in there. You know you're gonna be in place. The other thing is the bougie has a little curled tip, right? So you're gonna feel it vibrate as it goes over the tracheal rings. You'll know you're in the trachea. If, you, if you're in the esophagus, first of all, you'll be able to see that it didn't go in the right place. You wanna see it go above the arytenoid cartilages, okay? That's how you know you're not in the esophagus if you went above those. If you didn't see that, then you're, you're blindly doing it. That's not the right way to do it. But the other thing is you'll feel 
bump against the tracheal reeds as you, you got it in the trachea, you'll know you're in the right place. You don't feel that, you need to pull out. You're, you're not in the right place. Then you got this view right here, grade three. You see the epiglottis, but nothing else. That's a difficult airway. You got two options. Put the eye gel in or go back to just bagging them and get out of there. That's not somebody you're gonna get intubated. Don't even waste your time, okay? Or you, you can get one shot, get the bougie, use that tip and run it right along the underside of that epiglottis and see if it guides into the trachea. And you'll know because, like I said, you'll feel the tracheal rings bump against the tip of that that uh, that bougie catheter as you do it. If you feel it, hey, you're in, guide the tube in and, and get going. If you didn't feel that, you're not in, pull out, put in your rescue device and get out of there. And then if you have this where you go in and see nothing, don't waste your time. Put an eye gel in and go, okay? There's no sense in trying over and over and over again because most of the time, if you're gonna be successful, you're gonna see what you need to see very quickly. It doesn't take long. If, if it's taking you an extremely long time, more than one look, you're not gonna get it. You need to stop, stop wasting time. Get your eye gel in and get out of there. Stop wasting time, okay? <clears throat> So this is, this is all the stuff we carry in our bag, right? Your basics, your OPA, NPA, heat valve. It's all on the AMBU bag. You got your eye gel, all right? And you got this bougie. So you got these patients that they got, let's say they got a neck trauma, they got a seat collar on, or you know they got a stiff neck, can't really bend them back. That's where this bougie will help you out. You can't get a really good look. You know, you can only see this, or you can maybe only see that that bougie is gonna be helpful for you, okay? It'll kind of help guide you. And you can bend that thing to, to give it a, a, a bigger curve so it curves upward when you put it in rather than going into the esophagus. Um, if you can't get the intubation, your backup plan should be the eye gel, and the backup plan of the eye gel is your ambu bag, okay? Use the peak valve every time. Use the NPAOP if you need it. Give ketamine if they're not tolerating it, okay? If you don't feel like this is, you know, you're, you're looking at this patient, you're walking up, you're like, man, this guy is bad. He's got all the wrong things. This is not somebody I need to be intubating. Don't waste your time trying to intubate. Put an eye gel in and well, he's gagging and choking on it, give him a dose of ketamine and put the eye gel in and then get out of there. Don't waste time, okay? Um, if there is some circumstance where all right, you're gonna have to attempt it, don't attempt unless you've proven to yourself you can get the SATs up to 100%, okay? Can't tell you how important that is. <clears throat> Remember, our goal is to ventilate the patient. You guys are EMS, you guys are paramedics. You're not required to 100% intubate every single patient that you come across. Your job is to keep the patient alive and how do you keep them alive? You ventilate them. Intubation does not equal keeping that patient alive. And in a lot of times it ends up killing the patient. If you're able to bag that patient, and your SATs are 100%, that patient's getting air, you're seeing good chest rise, your end title is normal, and you got a good heart rate and blood pressure, you don't have to intubate the patient. Matter of fact, the first thing I think in our airway management protocol, I think the first line, if you read it, if that says, you know, two sets of greater than 90%, it's acceptable to not go further and try to put in an advanced airway. If your basics are working, go with it, okay? Scene time does not equal improved outcomes in our patients, unfortunately. So don't, don't uh, you know, think that you have to go advanced if what you're doing with your basics is working, okay? Um, I was at the Eagles conference uh, roughly about a month ago, and there was a study that they did. It compared the endotracheal tube to the eye gel to the King airway to just a combi tube in the LMA, and the eye gel was able to get a good seal and get the same pressures in the lungs that an endotracheal tube would. So don't feel like your pressure, if anybody gives you crap in the hospital, why didn't you intubate this patient? You'd be like, well, doc, you gotta talk to my medical director about that, and I'll take care of that. Okay, because there's never, you know, 
they don't understand some of these guys, the stuff that you're dealing with and what you're having to do it with and the pressure that you're under, okay? So, you know, our job is to ventilate the patient, not necessarily to make the patient. And then they forget, you know, sometimes we don't have fire there. It's just a paramedic and an EMT. And an EMT can do a lot, but only the paramedic can put in an IV and give the RSI drug. Of course, we can do IO, which is great, but you know, you got one person that has to do all this advanced stuff. It's not, that's not good for the patient. So you don't have to ever worry about, well, you didn't intubate a patient because how many of you have had a patient go into cardiac arrest because you, you did BVM ventilation rather than intubating them? Has anybody had a patient die on you while you bagged them instead of trying to do anything else? Anybody? How about with an eye gel? Did anybody ever put an eye gel in and the patient coated on you? I didn't go, but I didn't go Brady on me. That's just because my EMT feels too deep. Aggressive, right? A little bit. Yeah. Good. But did he arrest on you? And what happened when you pulled it back? It hard. It came back up. Came back up, right? Anybody ever seen a patient code after they got intubated? Anybody seen that? What would you rather do if it was you? <laughs> Say bag me all the way to the hospital is what I would tell you. So don't get in this mindset that you have to intubate a patient. Okay, let's say you get to the scene and you got a patient his O2 sat is 65%. You put an eye gel in, you do everything, and you get the O2 sat up to 85%, and you're like, I'm doing everything 100% the way he talked about, and all I can get is 85%. I can't get it up. What? I need to intubate. You know what? <laughs> Who cares? What did, what did anybody see anybody going to cardiac arrest with an O2 set of 85%? Anybody have that happen? So you, you took that patient's O2 set from 65 to 85, but you did some, some good work there, and that patient's probably been 65 for several hours. You're keeping him at 85, you got him way better, and it's probably gonna be for 20 minutes while you get to the hospital. And most people don't code at a heart rate, I mean, an O2 sat of 85%, right? So think about that, okay? So don't think that, well, I've got to intubate because this O2 sat won't get past 85 on me, okay? Because even if you got it up to 85 and you can't do anything else and, you know, they're like, why didn't you tube them? Well, doc, all you guys is, well, doc, I couldn't get them pre-oxygenated above 95%, and that's what our protocol says to do before we try to intubate. So we transport it, and that's it. And if they got something else to say, then you, you let me know about it, okay? But just remember that. I mean, you still have got the patient way out of harm's way, and you still improved them drastically. Don't think that you have to intubate, even if those two sets staying in the 80s, because that's better than what it was. And I guarantee you, these people have probably been that low for probably quite some time. It didn't just happen like that. So keep that in mind. Um, you have to, you know, and if you do have to intubate, just, just prepare for it. Slow down, slow your thinking. Don't get carried away with all the, you know, the, the hecticness and the craziness of, of the scene because you know, particularly for the paramedics. You know, I talked about earlier, I want them to pre oxygenate these patients to 100% and hold it for three minutes, right? Because A, that's gonna help you out if you do have to intubate. When you have to take a look, that's gonna give you time to, you know, make sure you can, you can see what you need to see and that patient's not just gonna drop down on you very quickly. During that three minutes, okay, you got everything in place. What you need to be doing is make sure you're set up and the mindset that you need to have is, okay, I've made the, the choice to intubate this patient because of what's going on. I'm able to ventilate him properly at 100%, but I've got a half hour trip and I need to get a good airway in this guy. I'm gonna intubate him, but as soon as I look, this is gonna fail. What am I gonna do next? And you need to have your backup plans ready to go. Okay. Approach every intubation as if it's going to be a failure and be ready for what's going to happen next. Okay. Um, and that kind of mindset, you will be prepared for whatever happens, whether you get it, whether you don't, 
you'll uh, you'll be sure the patient has a good outcome. Okay. So in summary, you know, calm down, slow down. Okay. Slow everything down. Make sure you've prepared everything. Okay. It's not a rush. Um, get yourself prepared. Get all your tools prepared, and make sure you've prepared the patient properly. Okay. Position and pre-oxygenate properly. Okay. And use capital on every single patient. Can't tell you how important that is. If you put a tube in the patient's anywhere in their trachea, even if it's, you better have that capnol ready to go. And if you don't have capnography, you better pull that tube, okay? Uh, because it's not in the right place if you don't have capnol, unless the patient's in cardiac arrest. But capnol on every single patient that gets intubated, don't forget that. And then this is something, I know our, our protocol currently does say to give vecuronium post intubation to, to kind of help keep them under control. It's not a great thing to do, okay? Um, because some of these patients, we give them what, Versed or fentanyl before we intubate them, that stuff's gonna wear off pretty quickly. And now you got probably an awake patient that can feel everything, hear everything, and has a, a tube stuck in their throat with a big old balloon in their trachea. It's a very uncomfortable, painful procedure to be intubated. We need to focus on giving them sedation to make them tolerate the airway better rather than just paralyzing them, okay? So ketamine, fentanyl, Versed, keep that in mind. You know, if you need to do a paralytic, do a paralytic, but I'd like to see us move more towards giving them sedation and analgesia before we just start paralyzing everybody because it's a very inhumane thing to do. And just close your eyes for a second and think about what it'd be like if you're paralyzed, you're awake, you can see everything, you can hear everything, you can't breathe, you can't move, you can't tell anyone, hey, that's hurting me. Hey, get that gigantic metal thing out of my mouth. Oh my God, that hurts. What are you doing to me? And what did you just shove down my throat? Okay, so think about what that feels like for a second. And you'll you'll think twice about just giving them vector on without anything for pain or sedation. Okay, and we're gonna work on that protocol after CE. Once we start doing some protocol revisions, that's gonna be something that I'd like to to kind of change as far as how we're managing post-intubation patients, okay? So a couple of housekeeping items, okay? These are just things that um, that have been brought up, you know, randomly about stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're an EMS, guys, okay? There is no predictability to anything that we do on a daily basis other than it's gonna be unpredictable, right? Does anybody know when they walk into a shift, yeah, I'm gonna be getting 10 calls today, I've got two transfers, one trauma and one cardiac arrest. No, you don't know what you're getting into, okay? So be prepared, okay? You can see the big, big theme of everything I'm talking about today is being prepared. Because if you're prepared, what happens? You have better outcomes. You're successful in what you planned on doing. And ultimately, the job that you're there for is to save a patient's life is gonna be, is gonna go a lot better for you. Use the blue bag, okay? I know it's it's heavy, we, we try to adjust it to make it a little bit lighter. Put it on the stretcher, take it in, and be ready for whatever you're gonna walk into. How many of you guys have had a you know dispatch, yeah, you got a 58 year old anxiety attack, you walk in there and it's because you know, it's not anxiety at all, it's cardiac arrest, and the person having anxiety is the person that called dispatch, not the patient. <laughs> not, I mean, you know, you, you very well know, I mean, dispatch, they can only tell you what they're told, and you know, people, people don't really know what's going on with their, with their loved ones when they call sometimes, so you need to be ready for it, okay? So take the blue bag on all the calls, and don't forget the blue bags on the scene either. Remember to take it back, okay? Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> remember these ketamine dosings, okay? So it used to be, the ketamine dosing for pain used to be 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. We've changed that, okay? That's almost an induction dose, all right? That's something I would give to one of you guys if I needed to reduce your dislocated shoulder or, or hip or something like that, all right? It's way too much for just pain. And what's happening is we're, we're, some of you guys have, have used it, completely knocks the patient out, makes them have 
seizure-like activity and all kinds of crazy stuff happens. And then we get them to the ER and the doc's like, what the hell is this? You know, what am I supposed to do with this? This guy's completely snowed for the next 30 to 45 minutes. So the pain dose that we're using is 10 milligrams, okay? One dose for adults, it's different for kids, but the adult dose for pain is 10 milligrams. There is a repeat times one after 15 minutes if the patient's pain is still greater than five, but keep that in mind, okay? Now, if you need to use it for eye gel toleration or you know for your airway or whatever, then you can give one milligram per kilogram, okay? Because we need to sedate these people if we're trying to put an eye gel or a gagging on it. But remember, it's a different dose for pain and for sedation, okay? The other thing, always get report on your patients, okay? Even if it's just a transfer that's going from Jacksonville to Tyler, and you know the doctor and the nurse in Jacksonville have spoken to the doctor and the nurse in Tyler, you need to make sure you know what's going on with that patient, okay? The trauma, yeah, they've got a femur fracture, they've got a, a pelvis fracture, they've got three broken ribs on the left side, and uh, you know they've got a, a broken wrist. Know that. Okay, write it down. Write down what all they've given. Yeah, they gave two units of blood. Um, they gave a liter of fluid and she's had 50 milligrams of morphine. Why is that important? Because halfway when you get from Jacksonville to Tyler and the patient goes apneic from that 50 milligrams of morphine, you know to give her some Narcan, right? So know what they've done, know what's going on with the patient. And then when you get to your destination facility, report everything. Okay, report what all they did, report what you had to do. Yeah, they gave 50 morphine, patient went apneic and brady on me, so I gave two of Narcan and everything reversed and here she is. And you'll, you'll, you'll save yourself uh, a little bit of trouble. There's nothing that makes us look worse. And it's not just us, but anybody, whether it's a nurse, a doc, nothing makes a care provider look worse than when they don't know their patient, okay? It may just be a transfer from Jacksonville to Tyler, but they're in your hands for that trip. And whatever happens to that patient between Jacksonville and Tyler is on you. So you need to know everything about your patient before and during the transport, okay? And you gotta report that, all right? Um, we're doing a really good job, guys, okay? As, a, as an agency, as an organization, we're doing a really good job. I meet with <coughs> physician medical directors of all these ERs, I meet with the nursing directors of these ERs, and they tell me every time, you know, your guys do a really good job. Um, you know, every once in a while we have small things, every US agency does, and nobody's perfect. I don't expect you guys to be. But overall, as an EMS organization, we do a really good job, okay? Um, but the important thing is we don't wanna fall asleep at the wheel, okay? We want to continue to improve. We want to continue doing a good job, and we want to become better. Okay, so you know it's my job to push you guys. Okay, you're going to screw up. We're also going to screw up. But when it does happen, we need to learn from it and grow from it. Okay, that's why you know things mess up. Depending on what happened with the patient, what the outcome is, you're probably going to hear from me about it. Okay, I'll take it the wrong way. Okay, sometimes I can be nasty about it. I apologize, but. You know, the, the goal is to make sure that you guys continue improving as paramedics and care providers and that we're taking good care of our patients and we have good outcomes, okay? So, you know, we need to, we need to stay on top of our game and we need to keep each other honest, okay? Um, any questions? The question I get a lot <laughs> is uh, for the ketamine uh, dosing for fentanyl. Other than an allergy, what would be your decision to do ketamine versus fentanyl? Um, you can do, so ideally, usually it detects both. Like, if, let's say if you have an intubated patient, is that what you're asking for? Just in general, for pain. Oh, oh just for pain, like if you have a broken arm. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of ketamine in general. It works. I like fentanyl. Um, just because. Sometimes ketamine can cause people to see weird things and hallucinate a little bit and stuff. And you just don't know what kind of reaction you're gonna get from these folks. So, you know, in, I've had people use it and they've had good outcomes with, a, with appropriate doses. 
but you can certainly you know, either or. I like fentanyl because I like to treat things with the medications that are made for it. And fentanyl is a painkiller, it's a pain medication. I like to use it for pain. Ketamine is, ideally it's for sedation. I use it more for sedation. I don't typically use it for pain, but it is something that you can use. And you know, I think with the dosing adjustment, I think it's okay to use it. You so know? there would, but, I mean, the, the I mean, I've talked to you on the phone about it right before, but mm -hmm. there wouldn't be really any indication to use one or the other. Not really, not really. Um, but just know what you're getting. Yeah. You know, don't. What I tell people is, you know, we have a lot of things on our ambulances and medications and stuff. Don't give a medication just to give it, just because you've never used it. Okay. Know what you're doing with it. Know how to do it. Know how to use it. Know the proper dosing before you try to do something that you've never done before. Okay, it's all there in the protocol, but you know, I've had some folks that are like, yeah, I gave ketamine well because I've never used it before, and they gave a, a wrong dose. That's not, that's not how that works, okay? So know your dosing, because the, the goal is we have a lot of medications that, that work on multiple different protocols, and that helps because we don't have to carry a full CBS in the back of our ambulance that way. So just know the different dosages and what you're using it for. But they're both fairly safe. I mean, all the drugs that we try to carry, there are medications that generally you could probably give it to anybody and it's not gonna have a terrible effect or outcome on them. And the dosing, we, we try to shoot for a dosing that's gonna be the same way. Any other questions? Okay.